Hello there. My name is Amanda Lee Evans, and I will be giving a talk today on social practice as conceptual ceramics. I'm a socially engaged artist, educator, and ceramicist based in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, and Washington in the United States. I hold an undergraduate and postdoc degree in ceramics and an MFA in art and social practice, and my work sits at this intersection. And I believe that uniquely qualifies me to discuss this topic today. I'll begin this talk by distinguishing and defining social practice in ceramics, where they intersect and how they differ, and then I'll offer some examples based on the areas they overlap. Quite a few examples, actually, so prepare yourself. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about my own practice as an artist working at the intersection of these two mediums. So let's start out by defining social practice. What is it? Portland, Oregon artist Kimberly Sutherland offers a definition here on the right. She says, an approach to art, social practice is an approach to art that is created with and for a public and is responsive to and motivated by the context and community in which the public exists. There is a focus on shared authorship and co-creation of the work through process. And in contrast to the traditional ways of art making where the artist is at the center, it blurs the line between producers and non-producers of culture, therefore in challenging inherent structures of access and power in the world. So what does that mean exactly? Social practice or socially engaged art is driven by context and audience, AKA a public, rather than by an object-based outcome. In socially engaged artwork, the work itself is the space created and shared among collaborators, participants, and artists. The people who experience the project are the primary and most important audience. This makes structure of, of an approach to making artwork fundamentally different from mainstream contemporary art. Social practice has the potential to upend and challenge hierarchical and accessible contemporary art structures at this moment by approaching the practice of art from a completely different orientation. Social practice or socially engaged art is known by many other terms as well, including relational aesthetics, new genre, public art, socially engaged art, dialogical art, participatory art, collaborative art, public practice, and more that's not listed on this list. But there is a common misconception that all activist artwork is social practice artwork. That's not the case. Artists who are engaging in political content through their work are not necessarily making socially engaged art. That's not to say that it's less important, it's just a different approach. While there is a significant overlap between activist work and social practice work, that doesn't mean they're one and the same. Social practice, just like any other art medium, can explore any topic. What defines social practice is its participatory and collaborative elements. If an artist is not collaborating with the public, but making activist work, I would not consider that work social practice. For example, not all paintings are landscape paintings. Not all artwork about landscape is a painting. Not all paintings are good paintings. Not all social practice work is good either. And I think that's important to say is that the, the more this art form develops, the more we can develop a critical discourse about what um, the best work in the field looks like. Not all social practice projects have an activist agenda. Not all activist artworks are social practice artworks. However, social practice um, can be distinguished by the fact that it is, it is an experiential or participatory artwork often artwork that's existing outside of the mainstream art institutions and in collaboration with the public. In the mainstream contemporary art model, there is a linear method for individual artists to create and disseminate artwork. These values are reinforced by Western individualism and are primarily designed for a singular elite art world audience. This model emphasizes the creation and exhibit, exhibition of an artwork for an art public. Similarly, the contemporary craft model is linear. A brand or singular artist design objects for exhibitions or for domestic spaces. This linear model centers the visual aesthetics of a craft object and its desirability. In a socially engaged art model, there are many elements contributing to a relational art experience and the various participants and collaborators and audience members in an artwork inform the project and provide feedback. Here you can see arrows moving various directions. 
Socially engaged artwork exists for its primary audience first and foremost, which may or may not be the collaborators and participants in the artwork. And then as you can see on the left corner, the secondary audience, which might be an art world audience, is not at the center. The projects I'm presenting today to you over these slides, we are the secondary audience for the artwork. We were not there to experience it in real time. The relational experience can also be referred to as relational aesthetics. The relational atmosphere in and around an artwork being present in that space is the artwork itself. And this aesthetic, this space is shaped by the artists and participants and collaborators. Socially engaged art emerged in response to the hierarchy and barriers of access that existed in the mainstream 20th century model of contemporary art. Socially engaged art shares common values with a traditional craft model. Within the traditional crafts model, a craftsperson was accountable to members of their own community. Their work was formed by and made in response to the needs of their own community. This cyclical relationship informed the making of work and its distribution. This quote by UK artist Jeremy Deller summarizes a shift in practice. He says, I went from being an artist who makes things to being an artist who makes things happen. And that is, in summary, what social practice is. And undeniably, the history of ceramics is about making things, but it's also about making things happen. And what a long, rich history can we draw from in ceramics? Many ceramic practices and objects throughout time have touched upon some of the values defined in this 21st century art practice called social practice. I think of the legacies of generations of potters passing down their knowledge one to another and how that legacy continues today. On the left, you can see a slide of Maria Martinez, who is from multiple generations of Pueblo potters in the Southwest United States. And on the right, a photo of the Sotano family in Mexico with an Arbol de la Vida, a centuries old tradition, ceramic tradition in their family. I also think about the place-based aspects of ceramics, how ceramics necessitate sharing resources. Ceramic century old tradition of sharing studios, materials, and kilns continues to this day. These are images of a women's wood firing walk workshop at East Creek Pottery in Willamina, Oregon. And the place-based aspects of ceramics, the work that artists are making today is informed by centuries old tradition of artists working in collaboration with the local sites in which they were inhabiting. I think of how historically the very nature of our material requires a sensitive response to place and a consciousness of our own occupation of the place. This slide is of Montana artist Frances Senska, who sourced many of her local materials from sites nearby where she was teaching at a university. At the time she was teaching, she wasn't able to order global raw materials in order for her students to make work. So she had to find a way to make those resources available in a local context. So ceramics and social practice, while different in their origin and approach, they share common values. Both mediums can be participatory, place-based, community-driven, collaborative, and useful. In the earliest 20th, 20th century, it was a ceramic object that transformed the way we think about and define artwork today. In response to an exhibition invitation, artist Marcel Duchamp took a common industrially produced porcelain urinal, signed it with a fake name and laid it on its side a, on a pedestal in a gallery. Until that pivotal moment, art was being evaluated based on its technique, material and craft. With the emergence of fountain, artwork became about context, concept and intention rather than craft. This set the stage for conceptually driven movements like fluxus, conceptual art and performance, which have all contributed to the emergence of social practice today. However, social practice emerged in response to many histories, not just the mainstream 20th century Western art canon. As Jenny Sorkin argues in her 2016 book, Live Form, Women, Ceramics and Community, craft and particularly ceramics contributed to the emergence of social practice as a collaborative community-driven art form. 
She says, it was modern craft and not modern art that spearheaded non-hierarchical and participatory experiences. And I believe that's true. When we think about the history of craft and the generations upon generations of people working together, creating alternative spaces to exist and make their work, of course, ceram um, ceramics has influenced social practice. In her book, Sorkin builds a case for the work of three female potters contributing to modern socially engaged art. Beginning with Margaret Wildenhain, she outlines the life and practice of this Bauhaus potter who fled Europe and eventually settled in a remote area of the Northern California coast. There she opened a summer pottery studio called Pond Farm. Her rigorous teaching practices, which centered pottery and the technical aspects of creating pottery at a time where pottery was out of fashion were transformative. There are stories of students going to live at Pond Farm for the summer and creating hundreds of pots and only walking home with just a few as only the best were deemed acceptable of keeping. Likewise, MC Richards, a member of Black Mountain College, one of America's earliest alternative art schools, is credited for her approach to pottery and pedagogy. Richards began her career as an English professor and poet and eventually switched to pottery in her 40s. Her writing focused on a holistic vision of an artist's mind, heart, body, and spirit, challenged the um, headfirst approach to art making at the time. Her pedagogical practice also considered a person's entire being, which is something that influences the way that we think about social practice today. Lastly, Sorkin makes a case for the work of Susan Peterson, who is also based in California. For a time, she had a ceramic TV show called Wheels, Tones, and Clay, which aired on public access television in Los Angeles, California. Her work made ceramic work accessible to a broader public and um, demystified some aspects of the medium. When I think about their work, I also think about early artists who are exploring relational aesthetics and relationships in their work and how that has contributed to the way we think of social practice today. Untitled Free was a work by Rick Ritt Terevanesia, a Thai American artist who first exhibited this work in 1992 at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. For this work, the artist moved the context of the contents of the gallery's back room into the exhibition space, placing all of the hidden objects of art on display. And he transformed the back room into a temporary kitchen where he prepared Thai vegetable curry and served it for free to anyone who wanted it. The work has been offered in several iterations since, since then. Tiruvanesia is credited for being a pioneer in the movement of art and social practice, popularizing the term relational aesthetics to describe the atmosphere or space he was creating through his work. The space itself was an aesthetic. And as part of the work, he was opening up a space for dialogue about race and migration, about the ways that a gallery space could be occupied and used, and what kind of artwork, what kind of possibilities artwork offered. Of this work, Tiruvanesia says, this work is a platform for people to interact with the work and with each other. A lot of it is also about experiential relationship. You are within it, you are part of it. The distance and line between the artist and audience gets blurred. In the following slides, I'll be outlining some projects that touch on the intersection of ceramics and social practice. Some projects identify both mediums, others as only ceramics or others as only social practice, but I will include them all for their kinship to their, the other projects in this conversation. I'd also like to acknowledge my own limitations in my research, which are certainly American and West Coast centric, which is where I'm located. I imagine that those of you watching from other regions probably have amazing examples to contribute, and I'd love to hear about those um, later on. But this is where I'm located, and this is with what's within my awareness. If you'd like to share any other works with me after the presentation, I'd be happy to know about it. 
All right, so we'll start with functional as a unifying aspect between ceramics and social practice. Function is the foundation of ceramics history and practice, and of course, that's the place to start. Cuban-born artist Tanya Bruguera has been teach, teaching and researching the concept of arte util uh, for several years. Arte util roughly translates into English as useful art. She defines useful art as art that is a tool or device for a mean to an end. Arte Util draws on artistic thinking to imagine, create, and implement tactics that change how we act in society. On the right, she defines Arte Util as the following. Arte Util should propose new uses for art within its society. It should use artistic thinking to challenge the field within which it operates. It should respond to current urgencies, op operate on a one-to-one -one scale replace authors with initiators and spectators with users, have practical beneficial outcomes for its users, pursue sustainability and reestablish aesthetics as a system of transformation. The idea of art that is useful or that is effective is not new. Before the autonomous orientations of modern art in the 19th and 20th century, we know that many art traditions had use as a primary function. Before the emergence of contemporary and modern art, art prim primarily operated as religious, ritual, practical, or educational, and as part of daily life. Of arte util, Bruguera says, the sense of arte util is to imagine, create, develop, and implement something that, produced in artistic practice, offers the people a clearly beneficial result. Certainly, there are many direct connections between the concept of arte util and craft-based practices. Ceramics has performed thousands of different functions throughout its history. And when I think about the power of ceramics of, uh, as a social medium, I think of its functional possibilities. This project, Arte Util by Tanya Bruguera, has had many different iterations. The Arte Util project exists as a physical and digital archive. It is a space to exchange information between artists on how art can perform a function in society. Pictured here is a pop-up museum of Arte Util, which makes visible the works online archive. You can visit the project's website to learn more about projects that are considered Arte Util or submit your own. Okay, this next project is an example of Arte Util, but it's not really an example of craft or ceramics. Mexican artist Pedro Reyes in 2008 created a project called Palas por Pisolas, or Shovels for Guns. And the project involves 1,527 decommissioned weapons, many of which were high power automatic weapons of exclusive military use. He took these weapons and transformed them into shovels that were used to plant 1,527 trees. These weapons were taken to a military zone where they were crushed by a steamroller in a public act. The pieces were then taken to a foundry and melted. The tools were made under specifications, such as a handle with a legend telling its story. This simple yet poetic act of reuse speaks to the power of art to be simultaneously functional and symbolic performative and practical. The poetry of this work also exists in its practicality and function, uh, working to transform violence into life. It's, it also sparks a dialogue on gun use and prevalence while offering a solution to the future use of these objects. I'm not sure if this organization considers themselves to be social practice, so I'm not gonna apply that label but I am including it because of its direct link to function and application. The People's Pottery Project based in Los Angeles, California, employs and empowers formerly incarcerated women, trans and non-binary individuals through paid job training, access to healing community and meaningful employment in a collective nonprofit ceramic business. People's Pottery Project's pottery can be found in places like Blackmas Museum Store and in West Elm. Each, person, each purchase comes with a printout of the story of the project and the people who made it. Founded by Dominique Perkins and Ilka Perkins, who also happen to be married, um, 
the work sparks a conversation on the options people who are coming out of incarceration face when looking for jobs. This project started in Los Angeles based artist and activist Molly Larkey's studio in 2019 after she began hosting free ceramics classes for formerly incarcerated, incarcerated individuals in her studio. She was thinking of it as a therapeutic medium. And that's how People's Pottery emerged. In addition to the technical skills of ceramics fabrication, employees learn about inventory management, marketing, and strategic business development while joining a supportive network of other members who have experienced similar hardships. Ritual. A common theme at the intersection of ceramics and social practice is ritual or the poetic space that exists in real time. I often think about ritual and ceramics through its direct connection with food. There are hundreds of examples of ceramics ceramics objects and experiences supporting ritual around food. One that immediately comes to mind is the Japanese tea ceremony, which dates back as early as the ninth century. Within this tradition, every aspect of the experience is considered. The room, the garden outside, the clothing, the quality of tea, the ceramic vessels, and the dance of hand gestures to prepare the tea. By bringing this ritual into our conversation, I'm not imposing a modern label of social practice onto the Japanese tea ceremony, but I do see a direct link in the kinship between this ancient practice and many projects at the intersection of ceramics and social practice today. There's clearly a link between food, ceramics, and community that many artists are drawing upon in their own work. Artist and veteran Aaron Tool makes great pots. Maybe his pots are social practice, maybe they're just pots, but the way that these pots are disseminated is where I see their social value. He's been making and giving away cups since 2011, and to date he's made close to 22,000 pots, most of which he's given away. Of this work, he says, I hope that some of the cups can be starting points for conversations about unspeakable things. I hope conversations flourish between veterans and people close to them. I also hope that some honest conversation can happen about war and its causes. Many of the cups that Aaron Tool creates have to do with themes of war and violence and thinking about the impact of that on the body and the psyche. Those cups are given away and available to people who identify as veterans as a way to spark conversation and reflection. The concept of ritual extends beyond food to the concept of healing and action. In 2016, American artist Simone Lee, who is known for her monumental ceramic sculptures honoring Black women, presented a durational participatory experience centered on healing as part of her residency at the New Museum in New York. This project, titled The Waiting Room, draws inspiration from the tragic death of Esmond Green, an African-American woman who in 2008 waited 24 hours in the psychiatric emergency room at Kings County Hospital before she was found dead on the floor. Lee says, what happened to Green is an example of the lack of empathy people have toward the pain of black women. The waiting room offers a black female vision of healthcare as an alternative to the hugely broken healthcare system in the United States. Of this project, Lee says, the project mines certain kinds of knowledge that are passed between Black women. I want to expand the idea of medicine to include other self-defense and care mechanisms like strategy or even desire as alternatives to the stamina and obedience that is expected as normative behavior. Herbalism and dance would fall into the category of knowledge that resists the market and capitalization. As part of this project, Lee invited a group of healers as collaborators into the work. Those healers activated the space with activities such as yoga and movement workshops, herbal healing rituals, and other forms of holistic care. The Herbal Remedy Library included herbs from medicine markets in South Africa, as well as several healing clays that were made specifically for Simone Lee from African healing practitioners. Those clays, including the Black Lives Matter clay, which is the pink clay on the right, 
were made to be worn on the body as protection during protests. In reference to rituals surrounding clay itself, artist Nicole Seisler and her work Preparing explores the ritual of preparing clay for throwing. Of this work, she says, wedging is the foundational language of clay. It is the principal action that imbues the material with functionality. The slightest variation in the angle of the wrist, the pressure of one's fingers, or the position of their palm will impact the way a wedged piece of clay is articulated. Each artist develops their own nuanced signature in the wedged object. The ritual of wedging is made visible by the artists and workshop participants, directly wedging on the wall. Making these wedging marks make a drawing of sorts that record the ephemeral experience. The project itself is about preparing clay, but it is in and of itself the project. And it highlights the labor and time involved in this ritual preparing to throw. Labor. Seisler's work brings me to labor and how it touches both ceramics and social practice. Labor is an inherent theme in craft-based artworks, as is the one-on-one -on -one relationship between the maker's material and their own body. Labor also connects to a commitment to tradition, tr technique, and final product. While I won't go into a deeper conversation on craft and labor, I assume that many of us here working in craft-based practices are already familiar with this conversation in our field, specifically how that re relates to ceramics. New York artist Meryl Laterman Euclid is known for her commitment to a conversation on maintenance work. In 1969, she wrote the Manifesto for Maintenance Art as a proposal for an exhibition in which she would live and work inside the museum and perform all of the domestic duties that she was typically performing for her, her husband and baby for the museum itself. In her manifesto, she writes, I am an artist, I am a woman, I am a wife, I am a mother in random order. I do a hell of a lot of washing, cleaning, cooking, renewing, supporting, preserving, etc. Also up to now separately, I quote unquote do art. Now I will simply do these maintenance everyday activities and flush them up to consciousness, exhibit them as art. I will live in the museum as I customarily do at home with my husband and my baby, right? Or if you don't want me around at night, I will come in every day for the duration of the exhibition and do all th these things as public art activities. I will sweep and wax the floors, dust everything, wash the walls, cook, invite people to eat, clean up, put away, change light bulbs. I might save and make um, margarations and dis dispositions of all functional refuse. The exhibition area might look empty of art, but it will be maintained in full public view. My work will be the work. My working will be the work. So her work in and of itself is about labor. And she's known for this early work, this feminist work of visualizing the work that women do in the home and claiming it as artwork. In her manifesto, she goes on to say, maintenance is a drag, it takes all the fucking time. The mind boggles and shapes at the boredom. The culture confers lousy status on maintenance jobs, minimum wages, and housewives have no pay. Clean your desk, wash the dishes, clean the floor, wash your clothes, wash your toes, change the baby's diaper, finish the report, correct the typos, mend the fence, Keep the customer happy. Throw out the stinking garbage. Watch out, don't put things in your nose. What shall I wear? I have no socks. Pay your bills, don't litter. Save string, wash your hair. Change the sheets, go to the store. I'm out of perfume. Say it again, he doesn't understand. Seal it again, it leaks. Go to work. This art is dusty. Clean the table, call him again, flush the toilet, stay young. Everything I say is art is art. Everything I do is art is art. We have no art, we try to do everything well, Balin is saying. And her comment, everything I say is art is art, reminds me of Marcel Duchamp's fountain and claiming that as art in and of itself and claiming anything I say is art is art is also a foundation to the work of social practice. After this work, Mary Laterman Euclid went on and it continues to be an artist in residence in the New York City Sanitation Department. 
Her initial work as this ongoing artist in residence was called Touch Sanitation, which was a two year project in which she attempted to shake hands with every single sanitation worker in New York City. In order to accomplish this work, she had a set schedule, working schedule similar to those of the sanitation workers and every day went out to shake people's hands. Perhaps inspired by Euclid's work, artist Holly Hanasian's project, Touch in Real Time, explores the power of touch at the crossroads of performance, clay, and neuroscience. Between 2012 and 2015, she crossed the country and held hands with people and asked others to hold hands. In each um, joining of hands, a small piece of clay is placed between two palms. Over 2,000 pieces of clay were collaboratively made. As people hold hands, they swap stories. Sometimes the bonding hormone of oxytocin is released into their bodies. The clay handshakes are fired and become an artifact for the moment that later becomes a series of exhibitions. In addition to this ritual of holding hands, the artists also explored the neuroscience around touch and care as part of conversation. Hanesian is part of an online network of artists called the Socially Engaged Craft Collective, many of whom are ceramic artists exploring craft and social practice. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to work with them on a publication and exhibition, and many of the projects centered around food. Play space. Throughout history, and until very recently, ceramics has largely been a place-based activity due to the nature and weight of our materials. Similarly, social practice is often rooted in and responding directly to a site, environment, or social context. I don't think this group might refer to themselves as social practice. And again, I'm not trying to impose a modern label that might not work for them but I want to bring them into the conversation for the way they are upholding tradition and working in collaboration with the land. The women of red clay or Las Mujeres de Paro Rojo are a group of women from a small Zapotec village in San Marcos who make burnished red earthenware pottery. For 20 generations, the families of this village have made red clay pottery into cookware and sold them to neighboring villages. This rural village is about an hour's drive from Oaxaca City along rocky roads into the mountains. Ceramic artists, part of the Mujeres de Barro Rojo collective work together to process clay and make these works. Every year after the corn harvest, the women head into the mountains to dig local red clay. They carry the raw clay on their backs down the mountain to be processed. Once back at their studio, the clay is processed and then molded by hand or on a wheel. It is then burnished with leather, corn cob, or stone. When enough pieces are ready, they are fired in an open fire pit or in the new uh, ceramics kiln that they built recently. The finished result is pottery that is not only rich in color and texture, but also provides a unique earthy quality to the food and drink. And it is an important preservation of the region's heritage each step in the process is connected to the land. I first became aware of this project in 2016 with a film that was produced by ceramic artist Betsy Rettelman, who's based in the uh, east coast of the United States. One group member, Macrina Mateo Martinez says, I watched the beautiful red clay pottery that my grandmother made, taught by her mother, who was taught by her mother for as far back as we can remember. I watched her trade a bowl that had taken hours to make for a small bag of beans or corn. She goes on to say, we work with our hands. We bring the mud from our fields. It takes a week to dry it. We wet it, stir it, strain it, and mix it with sand. Finally, we let it dry under the sun to make it. We are ready to work with it. In this process of taking materials from the land, well, once common in ceramics has um, disappeared with the emergence of global trade, but there are still artists working with this process conceptually in their own practice. Los Angeles based artist Adam Silverman's project Common Ground draws upon the ancient tradition of collecting raw materials from the land. In particular, this project involves harvesting three foundational materials 
clay, water, and wood ash from each of the 50 states plus Washington, D.C., and five U.S. territories, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, Samoa, and the North Mariana Islands. This picture shows all of the 56 clays together as individuals before they were mixed together into make a single clay body. Starting in early 2022, the artists will make 56 plates, bowls, and cups to be used to bring together 26, 56 people at a time around food for a conversation. Born out of polarized political climate in the United States, this project explores our conceptual common ground. What does it mean to share this land together that we now call the United States? Through this project, it explores um, and confronts the political divide that we are experiencing in the United States and what it might mean to work together or share a conversation over difference. Similarly, British artist Rosanna Martin's Brickfield is an experimental participatory brickwork project set in a disused China clay quarry. The project's aim is to use the process of brick making as a tool for empowerment and collective making. Through workshops and engagements of the site, participants use waste materials that come from the, the result of the China clay extraction process. Those materials are then formulated into a new clay body that is used for making bricks. The bricks here can be seen on the right. Thinking about bricks conceptually as a medium and expanding on that as a marker for place, artist Ayumi Hori and her collaborator Elise Pe Peppel's project Portland Brick aims to highlight what is significant about Portland, Maine by personalizing its streets. Hori is a potter and Peppel is a storyteller. Together they activate a pub public space in their town by making visible the layers of history on that site. Historical facts, personal memories, and future wishes connected to the India Street neighborhood of Portland, Maine were collected and used to create bricks telling the story of that site. With the exception of the project's first brick, which honors the indigenous peoples of the area, the Wabanaki people, each story on the brick begins with the phrase, on this spot, and confirms to, conforms to a character limit of a tweet. People can submit stories online through the project's website, and perhaps they will be turned into a brick in this public space. Antagonistic. Not all social practice work or ceramic work for that matter has to be saccharine. The work can be a bit antagonistic. Great art of any medium should be provocative and sparking conversation and perhaps social change. The artist I mentioned earlier, Pedro Reyes, who tur turned the guns into shovels, has a saying that every artwork should have just a touch of evil. If you think about an artwork as a formula, like making a cake, putting in your flour, your sugar, your eggs, adding your aesthetic elements, your conceptual framework, etc., sprinkling in a touch of evil makes the work slightly more interesting. In 2011, Ai Weiwei's iconic work, Sunflower Seeds, was installed at the Tate Modern in London. Leading up to that exhibition, the artist spent nearly three years working with a group of artisans in China. Each ceramic seed was individually hand sculpted, hand painted by specialists working in small scale workshops. While the final outcome of this work was a museum installation, what I find most compelling about the work is its production process and the aftermath of the exhibition. The sunflower seeds themselves represent the citizens of communist China, each seed acting as a metaphor for a single person or multiple people. The project was produced in an area known for its excellent work in porcelain during a time when the region's economic power was swindling. People were out of work and this project gave them work. Through this project, hundreds of people were able to make a living for several years. And of course, after the exhibition was installed, collectors and visitors alike wanted to take some sunflower seeds home with them. Although that was forbidden in the exhibition, collectors could purchase an authentic version of the sunflower seeds through auction houses. 
Uh, simultaneously, an alternative economy popped up for counterfeit seeds produced by the same artisans who had made the original seeds for Ai Weiwei. While this outcome may not be outlined in Tate's literature for the work, I believe the artist's desire to financially support this region of his homeland through this exhibition comes through through this counterfeit economy. And it seems that um, he did not encourage this, but also seemed somewhat neutral on the subject of a counterfeit culture emerging in order to continue to financially support some of these artisans. Spoils, a 2011 artwork by Jewish Iraqi American artist Michael Rakowitz directly for confronts our nation's relationship to war, plunder, culpability, and capitalism. 10 years after the attacks on the Twin Towers, the artist launched Spoils, a culinary intervention in collaboration with Chef Kevin Lasco at Park Avenue Autumn in New York City. The meal featured venison topped with Iraqi date syrup and tahini and was served on plates looted from Saddam, Saddam Hussein's palaces. The artist had purchased these plates on eBay from two sources who had plundered the plates from the palace. This project raises questions about a citizen's personal relationship to global conflict, our sensationalization of that conflict, and our own awareness of the places with which we're currently at war. Similarly, a plate in and of itself can be a place to tell a story. Painter Julie Green's ongoing project, The Last Supper, Final Meals of Death Row Inmates, is a visual representation of the last meal a person on death row ordered before they were executed. Through this simple painting of food, the artist creates an intimate portrait of the human person who was executed and humanizes a practice that is often discussed in national media in a very dehumanizing matter. The artist has been making these paintings for over 20 years. There are now 950 painted plates in the collection. She adds 50 plates a year and plans to end the series when our nation abolishes capital punishment or at a thousand plates, whichever happens first. The entire archive can be viewed on the artist's website and each plate is a distinct portrait of the last meal that a person ordered. In a similar spirit, Kara Levine's This Is Not A Gun is an ongoing project exploring police brutality and the objects innocent victims were holding at the moment they were shot by police. The artist noticed that often in police reports, the officer had mistakenly believed the victim was holding a gun while later, later coming to realize that it was not in fact a gun at all. A sandwich is not a gun. A hairbrush is not a gun. A wallet is not a gun. Since the year 2000, United States police have mistaken at least 38 distinct objects as guns during shootings of majority young black American men. None of the victims in this series were armed. This is not a gun engages with the public through community driven workshops hosted by artists, activists, healers and mindfulness collaborators. Together, participants shape these mistaken as gun objects and clay, giving presence to their form, the human rights violations and the racism prevalent in America today. Relational. Socially engaged art relies on the cultivation and care of relationships in order to be successful in the long term. Ceramics, in turn, is relational in its collaborative, collective studio practice. In order to share a kiln with someone, you need to learn how to get along. Located in Houston's Northern Third Ward, one of the city's oldest African American neighborhoods, Rick Lowe's Project Row Houses was founded on the principle that art and the community it creates can be a foundation for revisioning community in underserved neighborhoods. Founded over 25 years ago, the project transformed and refurbished a block of row houses into a multi-use space that increased affordable housing opportunities for low-income residents by expanding affordable rental conditions. Through its Young Mothers program, Project Row Houses provides up to two years of subsidized housing, counseling on parenting skills to mothers in need, and a place to call home in community. 
The project also offers free tutoring to students who need assistance, as well as a learning service project to provide hands-on experience beyond the classroom. Project Row Houses also hosts a community market to sustain local creatives and an incubator program that provides space, time, and mentorship to early career artists and individuals. Additionally, it hosts a rotating exhibition program in several of the houses on the block. Of the project, Rick Lowe says, you have to spend years developing relationships. It'd be arrogant to disregard of, of a community to come in and think you can grasp all the complexities of a place in a short time. And that's something I really admire about Rick Lowe's practice, his commitment to this singular project as a lifelong work. Many artists in this series are working in short-term projects, maybe a project that lasts several months or years. But to think of the scale of Rick Lowe's work lasting his entire career, or Mara Laterman Euclid, who I mentioned earlier, working in the New York City Sanitation Department, committing to that work for a lifetime is really astounding. And it also makes me think of the commitment that many craftspeople have had to their work throughout their lifetime. In Rick Lowe's work, the only way for this work to be successful in order for Project Row Houses to be sustained, the people involved in that project have to be stewards of cultivating good relationships and building trust over time and continuing to maintain that trust in the long run. In Chicago, artist Yester Gates has founded a similar project inspired by Project Row Houses. Gates has founded, during his time in Chicago, multiple projects, including Dorchester Art and Housing Collaborative, which is pictured on the lower right, which is 32 units of affordable housing in the Dorchester neighborhood, and is a, also contains a space for theater and dance, pictured on the far left. He also created the Stony Island Art Bank, pictured in the two center images, which houses a black cinema and archive, and he founded the Rebuild Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to transforming buildings and neighborhoods in the south, south side of Chicago, while sustaining cultural development as well as celebrating art. On top of all of that, civic, urban planning, and social practice work, Gates is also a sculptor and potter in his own right. And I believe he's one of the most important artists of our time. In 2012, Gates was invited to be part of an exhibition at the Smart Museum in Chicago called Feast, Radical Hosp Hospitality and Contemporary Art. As part of this project, he presented the Soul Food Pavilion, a series of five meals held in public space, spaces. For this project, Gates collaborated with chef Michael Kornick and soul food expert Erica Dudley to create menus and host a series of ritualized dinners which took place at Gates Celebrated Dorchester Projects. A diverse mix of guests joined Gates for each of the dinners, which combined meals served on specially commissioned ceramics created in collaboration with Japanese master potter and Gates' own teacher, Kochuki Ohara. Performance and discussions, as well as music, uh, existed as part of these ritualistic dinners. Each dinner had its own theme, including the geography of the soul, the art of the soul, the history of soul, the politics of soul, and the community of soul, all part of this project called Soul Food Pavilion. The Easter Gates makes many types of works, including traditional sculpture. Not everything he makes is social practice or ceramics, but this is a social practice artwork. On a much, much smaller scale, Detroit-based artist Henry Christman uses the kiln itself as a conceptual framework for exploring community and collective spaces in ceramic production. In 2015, he traveled around the country with his truck and a mobile onagama kiln he built on a flatbed trailer. The kiln stopped at various locations around the United States and at each site the kiln was fired with pottery from folks in the local area. The project draws from the communal and durational experience of wood firing, which in some kilns and cases takes nearly a week to fire. And it requires the labor of dozens of participants in order for that kiln to be sustained. Christmas kiln is a bit more efficient than that, but it does highlight the space shared during the late night of stoking a kiln. 
Similarly, in 2016, Chrisman created the backpack kiln, which was a tiny wood fire kiln he carried on his back and fired in various locations using wood kindling. The project debuted at Ensika's exhibition Across the Table, Across the Land, which was curated by Namita Gupta Wiggers and Michael Strand, and it has since continued on to other locations. Ceramic practice, which often due to its weight and space limitations, requires a rooting in place. Through this project, that rooting was upended by a lighthearted kiln that could be fired anywhere Crispin was invited to carry it. Collaborative. Social practice and ceramics are both collaborative mediums. They are disciplines that are difficult or perhaps impossible to completely do on your own. As we saw with the Henry Christman's kilns, many practices and ceramics require a community working together in order to achieve a result. In Francis Elise's 2000 work, When Faith Moves Mountains, the artists invited 500 volunteers to carry shovels up a sand dune on the outskirts of Lima, Peru, and asked them to work in unison to make it, to move a mountain. The result is a displacement of the dune by a several inches. The work consider, is considered a metaphor for Latin American society in which minimal reforms are achieved through massive collective efforts. Of this work, the artist says, sometimes making something leads to nothing. Sometimes making nothing leads to something. While this project is not of clay, it is a work engaging the earth itself and is reminiscent of raw material mining practices. The collaborative effort of 500 volunteers led to a small shift in the landscape. Japanese artist Koki Tanaka's nearly 70 minute long video work, a pottery produced by five potters at once silent attempt, makes visible the negotiating conversation that takes place during collaboration. In the video, potters begin with an empty analog wheel and raw clay and discuss what sort of pot to create and what their approach should be. The conversation wanders into how they should approach the pot itself. They wonder if the pot should be an amalgamation of each of their styles mashed together, or if they should determine a strong specific form and try to create that type of pot. They negotiate how their hands move over the clay and how to work together to bring the pot up in unison. This project was exhibited in the 2013 Venice Biennale, along with other videos documenting other practitioners negotiating making a collaborative project. There was a video of five, in addition to this video, there was a video in the exhibition space of five composers writing a song together on a single piano and five barbers giving a single haircut. Each of the videos high, highlights the conversation that exists in collaborative process and the negotiations that practitioners need to make while working together. In 2013, Urs Fisher's Yes work came to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. This Swiss artist began the installation of this, what has continued to be an ongoing work with a call for 1,500 volunteers to come to the museum over the course of 21 days. Some of those artists, some of those volunteers identified as artists and many of them didn't, but all were invited to come and work in clay during the weeks preceding the exhibition opening. Initially, the space was empty and filled with 308 tons of raw clay wrapped on pallets. Over the course of three weeks, volunteers came to make whatever they wanted out of clay and to fill the space however they felt led. Volunteers were fed chef prepared lunches daily as a pianist played music in the background. The result is an installation that becomes a collective portrait of the project's contributors, as well as the specific time and location in which it was made. The project can, has continued on to other locations. And of course, every time it's installed, every time it's performed by the artists and participants, it looks different depending on the site depending on the people who participate and depending on the cultural context of that place. And lastly, that brings me to my own work to share with you at the intersection of ceramics and social practice. 
In 2008, I was invited to be an artist in residence at the Red Lodge Play Center in Red Lodge, Montana. I proposed that during my one month residency, I would create a single bowl made with local materials. The project titled, You Can't Grow It, If You Can't Grow It, You Have to Dig It, tells the story of contemporary and historic clay mining and geology practices in the region surrounding the residency site. To make this single bowl, I met with 13 people who had a connection to mining, clay, or geology in Montana. The specific town of the Red Lodge is specifically in a site where there is a mine nearby that mines palladium for catalytic converters for cars. And there is a mine that runs nearby the town that had been historically a coal mine. But in the surrounding region, there are mines for many other metals. During the conversations I had with, with each individual in the project, each person gifted or directed me toward a raw material that I gathered and crushed up and used to make a glaze for this bowl. The clay itself was also gathered as part of this project. So the clay body, the glaze, the entire bowl is all made with collective raw materials that came from conversations I had with people who are part of the mining and geology industry. The project concluded with a potluck featuring the bowl and a book reading of interviews that had been recorded with each person. The project was a way for me to direct conversation with the raw materials I'm using in my own work and to have a more intimate understanding of the place I was occupying as a visitor. More broadly, I wanted to understand the systems that support me as a general consumer of ceramics products, of raw materials and items like my phone and um, other technology that I use that uses rare earth minerals and other minerals. And I wanted to understand that relationship to my own practice. The result is a book and ceramic serving bowl that reflects the questions, concerns, contradictions, experiments, tests, and explorations present in the mining industry today and by default, the field of ceramics. In 2015, my friend Krista Williams and I created The Global Table, a series of meals as artworks in East Portland, Oregon, that explored familial food heritage. Krista worked at a nearby community farm that employed immigrant women as teaching chefs on the farm. Several chefs presented their work as part of this project. We thought about each meal as an artwork in and of itself. The artwork was complex in its components, the food, the handmade plates glazed by each participant, the conversation and the setting were all part of the artwork, all part of the relational aesthetics. The project was an, att an attempt to bring a disparate group of people together to share a regular series of meals. We wanted to know how to build meaningful connection across age, race, class, language, and gender. When we create a meal together, we open up a sacred space to connect with others who on the surface might seem very different from ourselves. Through breaking bread together, we share our stories, our knowledge, our strengths, our struggles, and our talents. Gathering around the table, we lay the foundation for a resilient community. And in this project, we gathered for several months together to explore that topic and the resulting um, Take away from the meal were these plates that each person glazed based on their food stories or their food histories. Additionally, we made a recipe book with the meals that were presented at each dinner and the stories behind those meals. This project grew from fr friendship and the recognition of the power of food and community. Our communities are stronger when we can all work toward a shared global goal understanding, but we often lack spaces to meaningfully come together across difference and connect with people who are different from ourselves. A thoughtfully prepared meal and setting can provide a space and invite us to sit down, open up, and learn from each other. The last project I'd like to share with you is a project called Objects for Digestion. In 2015, I was invited to have an exhibition of sculptures at a gallery in Portland, Oregon. It was a nonprofit space and I was moving at the time and I didn't have a lot of space to store this work afterward. I wanted to make big sculptures for the exhibition, but I was struggling with what a mentor of mine, Christopher Miles, has called the sculptor's dilemma. 
which is what do you do with big work after you make it, especially if it's not work that you're selling. So this exhibition emerged as a solution to wanting to make sculptures that have that continue to live a life beyond the gallery and also draw upon the functional history of ceramics. While on display in the gallery, the objects present themselves as sculptures. When the exhibition ended, the objects simultaneously performed as sculptures and as functional containers for fermented foods. This project explored the fluid nature of sculptures as vessels, vessels as sculptures, in ceramics, the things we build are hollow, they are vessels, and the desire for art objects to maintain a meaningful, active, and functional life after they leave the exhibition. Pictured here are sixth graders at Harrison Park School in East Portland who make kimchi every year with produce from the community garden at their school. This jar sculpture lives in their classroom and they activate it by making kimchi in it. Each object in the series is equipped with the capacity to produce fermented foods such as kimchi, sauerkraut, kombucha, yogurt, and beer. Once the object is filled with an active culture, it becomes a living, breathing body. At the end of the exhibition, the objects were distributed to sites around Portland, Oregon, where they continue to live their lives to this day as dual vessels and sculptures. In conclusion, I hope this talk has illuminated the kinship and shared space between two mediums that I personally hold dear and believe hold the potential to shift both the power structures that exist in the contemporary art world and the craft world toward equity, humanity, and implied practice that makes, makes art accessible and available to all. Please reach out to me at the contact information below if you'd like to share work happening in your own communities that I'm not aware of, or if you would like to share any of your research that aligns with my own. Thank you so much for your time.